Hey, well, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here at Exodus Church, and we're talking um, this morning in our vision series about being a redeemed people, and as being a redeemed people, um, a new identity. And so as I'm thinking about identity, okay, uh, growing up, we used to call it an identity crisis. Everybody had an identity crisis back in the day? Well, my brother and I went from cowboy boots and cowboy hats. I'm talking chasing neon rainbows and riding 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu um, to some baggy Jinko jeans, anybody remember those, and some G-unit spinners around my neck. Uh, my identity crisis gave me whiplash. I went from the 4-H club at the state fair to BET's 106 in Park. Confused young man I was. But, you know, don't laugh at me, okay? Because I know some of you got the same stories, all right? I I I've seen your throwback Thursdays on Facebook, your TBTs, if you will. And, uh, I mean, I've seen things from afros to mullets, you know, business in the front, party in the back. Um, I think they're coming back, by the way. Uh, Farrah Fawcett, hairdos, bell-bottom jeans, okay? Um, or maybe, um, this was, yep, this is my generation, a big wave bangs looking like a tsunami just coming off the forehead. I mean, just, they used to hairspray, the girls hairspray before class, jean jackets, uh, sweatshirts with like the neck cut out, neon fanny packs, okay? Yeah, see, I was going to pull your card too. You weren't just going to laugh at me, all right? Uh, see, maybe we thought that we were casting uh, for the show Grease or Charlie's Angels or Saved by the Bell, holler, or the Fresh Prince of Bel Air. No, not that Bel Air. Or maybe we were all just experiencing a little bit of identity crisis, okay? Um, but on a more serious note, identity crisis happens to us, not just in our early, more formidable years, we're still trying to figure out ourselves, but also later in life. When life gets hard, when life doesn't go as you expected, I mean, ever been in a place where you lose all strength and you cry out in prayer? I mean, even atheists will look to the sky and scream, what gives? And hard times hit you like a ton of bricks, especially when you're a Christian. I mean, you, you start asking questions like, God, am I really your child? Uh, um, and, and if I am... Why is this happening to me? I, I, I thought I was yours, or is this just a mistaken identity? I thought that you had me, God. I, what's going on? I don't even know what I'm living for. I don't know what my purpose is, and I don't know what the purpose of all of this is. If you can relate to a situation like that, then you can relate to the people of God in the Bible. You see, the first two books of the Bible, we learn that God's people had entered Egypt as a foreign people and lived there as minorities for about 400 years, enslaved to the Egyptians. See, but when they started multiplying in number, the Egyptians feared that they would team up with their other foreign enemies, that when enemies would attack them, they would join with them and fight for their freedom. So the king of the Egyptians started increasing the harshness of how they treated the adult slaves. We learned last week they even issued that their baby boys would be killed, hoping to keep them as the minority, hoping to keep them from rising up, hoping to keep them enslaved. And so the people of God cried out, what gives God? What's going on, God? I mean, little did they know, though, that God actually saved one of those babies, right? One of those babies' boys from being killed, born of an Israelite slave woman. His mother floated him down the river in a basket to escape death, and the boy was found at the palace. Ironically, he would grow up in the king's household as a prince. Talk about identity crisis, right? I mean, Moses, an Israelite, would grow up as an Egyptian. But as a grown man, he witnessed the abuse of his enslaved people. One day, he came upon an Egyptian, beating a Hebrew slave, one of his own people. And Moses killed him, solidifying his identity. He chose who he was going to be. And as a true descendant of Israel, he hid the Egyptian's body under the sand. And then he, you know, he kicks rocks. I mean, he's out of there. He, he escapes. He leaves. He runs away. He's out in the desert. I mean, talk about whiplash. Moses went from the prince of Egypt to a runaway Hebrew and a shepherd of sheep. 
God's people, their identity remained the same. As mistreated slaves to the Egyptians. And once again, they cried out for help, but would God hear them? Did God see what they were going through? God, they'd be thinking to themselves, God, we're your covenant people, or are we not? God, you told Abraham that we would be as kings, that kings would come from you, and yet we're slaves. Who are we? Are we Israelite slaves, or are we the people of God? And if you turn your Bibles to Exodus 2, 23 to 25, you'll see that during those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. And here you go. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant, his promise with Abraham, and with Isaac, Abraham's son, and with Jacob, his son. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and then they came to Egypt. Yes, God saw the people of Israel in Egypt. Yes, God knew. God knew. And God was coming to the rescue. You see, while Moses was keeping watch over his sheep in the desert, God appears to Moses in a burning bush. And in verse 4 of Exodus chapter 3, we see that when the Lord saw that Moses turned to see this burning bush, that God called out to him from the bush and says, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. He said, do not come near, take off your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father. Yes, your enslaved Hebrew father in Egypt. Yeah, I, I am the God of your family, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to even look at God. Start praying and asking God what, what's going on, what gives. Sometimes he's going to show up and answer. And that's exactly what he does. In verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, taskmasters, slave owners. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. You see, the Lord saw them. Did you see that in the text? The Lord saw them says the Lord, he heard them and said that he knew. See, the Lord saw them in their slavery. He heard their cry and he knew their suffering. So in Exodus 3, 7, the Lord says, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Exodus 3, 10, this is where we even get the word Exodus. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. This word, when translated uh, by 70 Hebrew scholars in the first, uh, not even the first century, before Jesus' time, 300 years before, 70 Hebrew scholars are translating the Old Testament Hebrew Bible into Greek. And they translate this word, the root word, exago. If you remember from last week, I'm talking about the Exodus. And this is the great Exodus that God is doing with his people. God is coming to free them, coming to bring them out of Egypt. And the Lord did redeem them from slavery. Check out Exodus 6.6. 6. The Lord says to Moses, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and get this, with great acts of judgment. Let's talk about two of the words that are in there. The first one is redeemed. What does redeemed even mean? I mean, we have that a lot, like, you know, a redeemed people, right? So if you're going to claim that yourself, yeah, you're a redeemed people, what does the word redeemed even mean? It means to buy back, 
means to purchase, to redeem something. You can redeem a lot of things, land and, and otherwise, but in this time, in this context, is redeeming slaves. And, and what God is saying is, I'm going to purchase you from your taskmaster. I'm going to purchase you. I'm going to pay your debt. I am going to release you from slavery, and you will be mine. And he's going to do that. He's going to purchase, but he's also going to punish. Did you see that in the verse 2? By, at the very end, uh, not to, at the very end he says, acts of great judgment. You see that in Exodus 6.6. 6. With acts of great judgment, he's going to redeem them. So he's going to purchase them and punish. You see, that's what the plagues were. After nine other plagues, God would do one final plague of judgment that would set his people free. But ironically, it would be the death of firstborn sons, but not of the Hebrews, right? See, the Lord told the people to prepare what would be instituted as the Passover meal. They would sacrifice a lamb without blemish, and they would eat it, but they would also, what? Apply the blood of the lamb to the doorposts of their homes. And that night, the Lord would pass over Egypt, killing the firstborn in all of the homes that did not have the blood of the spotless lamb on their doorpost. So in Exodus 12, 29, that's indeed what happens. The Israel slaves, they, they do as the Lord commanded. And that night, midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, even all the firstborn males of the livestock. And there was a great cry in Egypt, but not from the slave. It was from the oppressors, the Egyptians. And so Pharaoh even summons Moses in the middle of the night after finding his firstborn son dead. He finally says, yes, go. Just go. And so they fled Egypt. The people of God free from the slavery. They, they free Egypt. But what happens? Pharaoh changes his mind and sent soldiers with horses and chariots to retrieve them and bring back those people as slaves. But God would not allow this. Why? Because he redeemed them. He purchased them. They no longer were the Egyptians. He says, no, they are my own. So with their backs to the Red Sea, what happened? But the newly freed slaves began to fear their old taskmasters. But Moses said to the people in Exodus 14, 13 and 14, he says, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. The Lord your God will fight for you. He has redeemed you. He has purchased you. He will fight on your behalf. God, through Moses, what does he do? But he parts the Red Sea. And the redeemed people of God walked on dry ground to the other side. But God then brings down the waters of judgment down upon the Egyptian soldiers. And their once slaves stood on the shoreline in all of their God. Exodus 14, 30 and 31. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. And what happens? They no longer fear their former masters. They no longer fear those who used to hold them in bondage. Instead, the people began to fear the Lord. No, you better not mess with my God. And, and they believed in the Lord. They trusted Him. They said, I'm not afraid of Him. He's protecting me. They believed in the Lord. They trusted the Lord and his servant Moses. You see, they now had a new identity. A new identity. No longer as slaves. They were a redeemed people. Standing on the shoreline of the Red Sea, they burst into worship. How could they not? How could they not burst into worship? They're no longer slaves. But as Pastor Kyle said last week, their identity changed as they passed through the waters. They were now God's redeemed people. One of the lines in that worship song they sang was Exodus 15, 13. You have led in your steadfast love 
in your steadfast, unfailing love towards us. You have led us, the people whom you have redeemed, whom you have purchased. And you have guided them by your strength, your holy abode. You see, this new identity changed everything. They no longer were slaves to evil and oppressive Egyptians, but were purchased by a loving God who heard their cry and rescued them from their slavery. But how quickly they would forget. Oh, how quickly they would forget. As Moses was even up on the mountaintop, right, with God receiving the Ten Commandments. Before Moses could come down, the people's hearts, their hearts had already returned to worship the gods of Egypt. Exodus 32, 1-4, through when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together and to Aaron, Moses' brother, and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what would become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears, brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool, and he made a golden calf. And they said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You see, though they were freed from the Egyptians, there was a greater master, a greater master that ruled their hearts, and that master was sin. See, the people would cry out again and again. But this cry was a different cry. This was a cry asking God, free me from myself. Free me from me. You change my circumstances all day, but there is something within me that is wrong. God, I I, I need your deliverance. God, I need you to free me. And God would hear their cry. And he would raise up a man, a man even like Moses, Deuteronomy 18, 18, saying, Uh, A man like Moses from among them. But this man would actually be God himself. You see, Jesus is the Lord. He's God in the flesh. And the Lord has come to set his people free. You see, the Lord sees us. And he hears us. And he knows us. The Lord sees us in our slavery. He hears our cry and he knows our suffering. Luke 4, 18 to 19, Jesus goes in the synagogue and he's handed a scroll to read from Isaiah. And he says, this passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Why? Because this passage is about me. What did it say? It said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Check this out. He has sent me to proclaim liberty, freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty, freedom, those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. See, this is the second exodus. Greater than the first, God has come to free us, to free us from the slavery, the captivity, the oppression of our sin. The Lord indeed does redeem us from our slavery. That's exactly what he does. Romans 3, 23 to 26 says that everybody needs this redemption. Romans 3, 23 to 26 says that everybody, all mankind needs this sort of redemption. For all have sinned, the scripture says, and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. See, I love how uh, Pastor Charles Spurgeon uh, would, would say, he would say that we are all sinners. We all have sinned in the same way that we all have uh, this venom within us. Venom within us. What he's talking about, he's talking about venomous snakes. And he, he equates it to all of us having that venom of sin within us. He goes on to say, yeah, there are many reasons why uh, the snake may not bite. He said, there are are many reasons. Maybe it's your education, the way that you were brought up, the good things that you were taught. Maybe even uh, it is the law and the government that is around you 
that has kept a lot of your sin at bay, whereas somebody else maybe has struck out and you have witnessed a venomous bite. He says, but just because the snake doesn't bite, a poisonous snake doesn't bite, doesn't mean there's not venom in its fangs. And it's in all of us. Right? I mean, after you leave here, okay, and it's lunchtime, all right, and you start getting a little hungry, you know, some of you are like, I'm already hungry, I missed breakfast. And you start getting a little angry, and all of a sudden you're hungry, and your angry turns into hangry, okay, and then you start feeling the venom welling up in your fangs, right, even just in the car ride home with your lovely, wonderful spouse who has no venom in her fangs. Thank you. Or, I mean, I really see the uh, coming out with my parenting. Any parents in the room say, yeah, I didn't know just how evil I was till I had kids. <laughs> but it goes both ways. We're all born that way. You don't have to teach them to sin. It's within them. Because <laughs> all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, all must be justified by grace. By grace as a free gift. Because if we're all sinners and we all have sinned and we all don't deserve salvation or redemption. Thus, it must come to us as a free gift through, check this out, how do we obtain this? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Well, wait up a second. How is there a purchasing? How, how is there this sort of transaction of purchasing in the person of Christ Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you continue on in the verse, it says that this redemption that is in Christ Jesus was in the one whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Another big word, propitiation. What, okay, Propitiation means that Jesus existed as a wrath absorber in your place. That means he, he stands forward, he comes forward, and by his blood, by his offering, he stands as a wrath absorber Do your sin. And it's to be received by faith. See, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over. Sound familiar? He had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, what happened to the Hebrews? What happened to the Israelites? But once they got out into the desert, they realized it wasn't just my environment. There's something within me. And their hearts were as evil, just as evil as the Egyptians. All mankind, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so what happens to even God's people? But God's saying, I need to judge you because of your sin. But as in his divine forbearance, he passed over and forgave their sin. And you think to yourself, well, God, how can you? Forgive sins, even such as Moses, who committed murder. David also. How can these people place their faith in you and their sins be passed over? Because Jesus is the propitiation, your substitute. He is your Passover lamb, if you will. He takes on the wrath of God. You see, in Exodus 6.6, 6, do you remember that God was coming to purchase his people and punish the oppressors? Well, what happens when they're the same person? What happens when God wants to redeem you, but because of your sin, He must punish you? Propitiation by the blood of Jesus. Redemption in the name of Christ Jesus. He takes your place. He's, he's your Passover lamb without blemish. He knew no sin. To those who receive Him by faith, the Lord will pass over all of the homes who have the blood upon the doorposts of their hearts. By faith, you must receive him. The Apostle Peter alludes to Jesus as the Passover lamb and the second exodus in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, connecting to the past, not with perishable things such as silver or gold were you purchased, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You see, that is Jew and Gentile, sinners alike, were placing their faith in Jesus as their Passover lamb. They were then baptized as a sign of entering the new covenant 
made by his blood, thus identifying, them, identifying themselves as God's redeemed covenant people. Therefore, likewise, we who have placed our faith in Jesus, we too have a new identity. We're no longer slaves. We're a redeemed people. For all who are in Christ have been redeemed. Ephesians 1, 7. In Him, in Jesus, we have redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. We didn't deserve it. And Romans 6, 1, 1 through 6 says, Well, what shall we say then? Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Should we continue to sin so that grace may increase all the more by the riches of His grace? He says, no, your identity has changed. He says, no, by no means. How can we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Your salvation was for the purpose of you walk in newness of life, not to act as your your former identity as slave to sin. You've been free to follow him. For if we have been united with him in the death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be, what, enslaved to sin. Jesus associates himself so much, so closely with you and with me that he actually takes on the punishment due our sin and unites us so much that we are now in him, so much so now that we have died with him and have been raised with him. This is what our baptism even represents, right? I mean, believers who got baptized in the first century, believers who get baptized today, they must know that their baptism was a sign, publicly marking an identity change. As we pass through the baptismal waters, we no longer should be counted as slaves to sin, but as God's redeemed people. Amen. Therefore, if you and I are not just a redeemed person in isolation, but if we are redeemed people, I mean, if we've been set free by the blood of Christ, if we are his redeemed and all of us together were to walk in this sort of newness of life, how might our lives be used by our God in this city or in this world? What would be accomplished? What would a church look like fully devoted and surrendered to the Lord? We'll get into that next week. Next week, we talk about a new mission, a renewed mission. Because indeed, a new identity gives new perspective. New identity gives you new perspective on life and a new purpose in life. But be warned, your enemy, the devil, will attempt to throw you off God's purposes for your life, often by attacking your identity. So often. Because identity informs your mission and your purpose. So if he attacks your identity, he throws you off completely. And sin, sin still wants you enslaved. Sin wants you to continue to have this sort of identity crisis and lie to you and tell you that you're still a slave. Backing you up against the waters of the Red Sea like the Egyptian army. Sin will creep up on you and chase you down time and time again. And like Pharaoh, your sin does not want to let you go. You see, sin wants you enslaved to guilt, to shame from your former sins, ashamed of who you are, enslaved to fear, the fear that comes when you think about your old master approaching on horse and chair. But you're not a slave anymore. You've been redeemed. And God says you are his and that he will fight for you. You see, so you can leave Egypt behind you. Matter of fact, maybe we should tell Egypt to get behind you. Because you've been buried with him 
with Christ through baptism. I mean, sometimes in our weakest moment of temptation, we need to just say, I'm dead to that. That is not me anymore. I'm no longer a slave. I've been redeemed. I follow a new master, and his name is Jesus. See, Jesus is my Passover lamb, and his blood covers my sins. And I can stand on the shoreline of my baptism, declaring that I've come out of the waters a new creation. See, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You can declare this with me. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was dead, but now I am alive. I used to be a slave to sin, but now I'm a redeemed child of God. And this morning, may we leave our old sin masters buried beneath the waters of our baptism. For sin is no longer your master. For the Lord has drowned our enemy in the Red Sea of Crimson. In the name of Jesus, this morning, let your sin, let your chain of slavery fall off. Let them fall off. Let Jesus set you free. Let him set you free. What is it? What, in, in fear, ashamed, guilt? You're not that person anymore. You've been set free. And there will come a day when life hits you hard. It's either happened to you, is happening to you, or will happen to you. Maybe all three. But we live in a sinful and fallen world. And sometimes life's just hard. And you might feel like God doesn't hear you. Or like he doesn't see you. Or maybe he just doesn't care. Feeling the whiplash of your identity when the whispers of the devil start creeping in. Telling you, you're not a loved child of God. If God loved you, why would you let why would he let you suffer like that? That has been a theme in my life of that voice. If God loved you, why would he let this happen to you? I often find myself praying prayers like this God, if you loved me, then you would do this for me. God, you know how much that meant for me. You know how much that would mean to me. I thought if I follow you, I get all the desires of my heart. Why did you not give me this? God, if you love me, you would give this to me. God, if you love me, you would do this for me. Or God, if you love me, you wouldn't have let that happen to me. I thought you loved me. I thought I was your beloved child. But I can't understand it. In the moments of those sort of questions, I can, church, I can only tell you this. I don't know the answers to all the questions. Why does God allow such horrible things to happen? Why does he allow evil and suffering into your life? Why did he let that happen? You know what? At least for me, when that's happened to me, I really don't want answers. Some people try to offer their answers, and it just makes me more angry. You know what I mean? Um, it's like, I don't really, I'm not really asking for answers. I'm just trying to say, what gives? But the only answer I can give is the one that the Lord gave me. When I started asking God, if you love me, then you would. God said, no, I do love you, and I did. I said, God, if you love me, then you would. And God said, no, I do love you, and therefore I did. I did come. I did hear you. I did see you in your slavery, and I have come. I've already proved my love to you. Has he not? I mean, my God has suffered in my place. He took upon his own flesh and blood. He became flesh and blood that he might feel it all the more. Even rejecting the wine, medicinal feeling. He, he felt the full weight of my sin and your sin. He took your place. He suffered in your stead. He's well acquainted with your suffering. He loves you. And so he did. Let me tell you today, God sees you. Some people say, I don't need an answer. I just need to know. And yes, it's true. God sees you. 
He hears your cry. He knows your suffering. And if you're trusting in Jesus today, you can know that he does love you and that you can identify yourself as a beloved child of God. One of his people. No longer a slave. Amen? No longer enslaved to sin. This is our new identity. We are a redeemed people of God. Live in that freedom. Let us pray.